series that we're doing, Made for Mondays, and over the last few weeks, we've been looking really at sharing our faith, sharing the good news. And the first Sunday that I spoke about this, um, I brought out a, a, a distinction that I think is important for us to be reminded of, and that is the difference between evangelism and missions. And, and it's just doctrinal words, because we're called, all of us, to get out there with the good news. We're not made for Fridays, TGIF, we're made for Mondays, where we get the good news out. And the good news is what God is doing in our, our lives, our hearts. So here's the thing, evangelism is sharing that good news with people who are like you. Missions is sharing that good news cross-culturally. Because the world has become a global village, you can go out on Long Island and actually do some mission work right here on Long Island. When you're connecting with people who think differently to you, look differently to you, um, approach the world differently, you're right in the middle of missions. And uh, it's an amazing opportunity that God has given us to be able to share uh, with people. Now, here's the thing. When you've got to do a business presentation, or you go into a work interview, you've actually got to put some thought into it. If you actually want to get the job on the line, you've got to put some preparation into it. So yeah, we're talking about life and death issues. And I want to encourage you not to just stumble into your conversations, but to have something to say because you've prepared, you've thought about it, you've actually specified and laid what God is doing so that you have a message that is not wishy-washy, but that is powerful and to the point. So if you'd like to practice, come and practice with me. I am available. So today's um, sermon is called Finding Sons of Peace and Having Something to Say. And, and I want you just to think about this in opening. The work that God has already done in you, the trials, the tribulations that you've come through, the adversity, the suffering, the victories that you've had over addictions, over temptations, the, that work that God has done in you is likely the work, the message that God is going to go through you. You harvest your pain for the sake of the kingdom. You harvest the perils and the triumph for the glory of Jesus Christ. So what that means is our lives are like broken bread. We open up and we say, hey, this is what the struggle was. The struggle is real, but God is great. And you begin to connect your story with his story. Um, so it's, it's really important that you think about what God is doing in your life. You name what God is doing in your life. You name the gap between where you are and what you still want God to do. Because for all of us, there are gaps, right? The, the only point of perfection is God. So there's, there's some gaps we're asking God to speak into in our lives. And sometimes it's talking about that deficit that allows people space to voice their own doubts, their own questions. Now this conversation, what the good news is, this conversation originally started with Jesus, right? Jesus invited 12 men to follow him. And after that, we read in Luke chapter 10 that Jesus then invited 70 to follow him and actually sent them out two by two into every village, every town that he was going to come. And they literally were, if you like, a wave of preparation where he was sending them out not just with the message of what he was preaching, but to go and do the very works that he was doing. And, and I know this is something maybe a little bit radical for some of you to think about, but if you get into a conversation with someone in the week and they're struggling because they're financially strapped or they're struggling because of health issues, you do realize you're God's hands and mouth in that moment. And sometimes reaching out is simply asking someone, can I pray with you right now? And being willing to put yourself out on the line like that 
makes for some life-changing moments. I remember there, there, there was, I was at Walmart one day, the lady cashing me out was approached by a man who gave her a summons for divorce. And yes, she is in the middle of, of the day, in the middle of a job. And uh, she opened this up and just started crying. And I said, can you just take a moment? Let's pray together. And when you're in that moment, you don't even think to ask, but you do want those kind of people who are willing just to step out of the, the little boat, right? So Jesus sent these uh, 70 followers out and he said in Luke 10, verse 5 and 6, Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. He sends out his followers and he says to them, find sons of peace. And, and it's a very simple message. He's saying, focus on the people who are receptive to the message. The people who are not receptive, he actually goes on to say, shake the dust off your feet and move on. So don't get stuck in the mud. Don't get antagonistic or resentful or whatever. People are people. You're one of them. And we all know you have those moments, right? Or is it just me? Find sons of peace who are receptive to your good news. And here's the thing to think about. You have something to say that can help someone connect with something of God. Now when we start to think of sharing all this amazing good news, Jesus came to us because God so loved the world. Jesus came and died on the cross to take care of all your sins and mine as well. When you start thinking about all this enormous good news, and so uh, you feel like you've got to be a, a theological PhD to get it all across. No, we want to really just look at bite-sized messages. So what happened this week? Well, I went without coffee for two days. How did I feel? Well, you know, I had to pray a little bit more. Come on. Just simple things. What are the things that you're needing to pray about? So he says here, yeah, find sons of peace. Focus on those who are receptive. Then Jesus went on and said, just take enough for the road. Don't take too much, you know, you're not packing for life. Kind of thing. And really the focus is on simplicity and humility. You don't have to be profound, eloquent, highfalutin. You just need to go out with the seed the deposit of what God has already done in you. And that is going to speak louder than any words the message is going to come across. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about finding your voice. And there are two aspects about finding your voice is uh, that I want to share. Firstly, though, I do want to say this. Your voice print, your digital voice print, is as unique as your thumbprint, as your iris scan, your voice print is as unique as the tears that you cry. Because tears under microscopes, under a microscope is like snowflakes. They're all distinctive. So there is a sound of the work of God that will come through your voice that will not come through anyone else on the face of the earth. That's a remarkable thought. You want to just soak that up? Something of the sound of God's voice will come through your life. That is a beautiful thing. And there are some people waiting to connect with God when you open your voice, when you open your mouth. So you've got to, in order to find your voice, ask yourself the right questions. And this is something I'm really encouraging you to go away, put some thought into it, just like you do for the job interview. Just like you do when you're putting your best foot forward, first day of school, first day of college. What did my life look like without faith in Jesus Christ? What was my life like before I experienced Christian community? A lot of the people here that I've spoken to over the years of crossover, one of the hallmark features of people connecting with God is to experience the love unconditional love of Christian community. When they see, when they know unconditional love in community, 
they start to see something of the love of God, of who God is. It's a powerful connection point. I've spoken, for instance, to someone who, who came in and fellowshiped here with us for about six months and, and then began to speak about how alone they felt in their life. How alone and lonely. And over the course of months sitting here, they just felt God take the shell of loneliness away. And so you find that Christian community can be a real healing instrument that God uses if you give voice to it. Another element in finding your voice is to think about what kind of people you relate to. And I was reminded of a story a woman in South Africa told me. Having gone through a divorce, she said she felt like she had a big red X marked on her back. That she couldn't go to church because the church people were judging her, criticizing her, and gossiping about her. And she said somewhere along the line, she came to settle that God wasn't judging her, that God was loving her, loving her through it, loving her in the middle of it. And she actually went back to church. She said, my life message, if you're going to figure out who God is, is sometimes his church doesn't get the full representation. So out of your life stories can come some powerful messages. <coughs> what is my current story? How is God working in my life right now? Because the work he's busy with now is different to the work of last year. My husband, uh, being a farming man, a man of the earth, reminds me often how um, after a severe pruning, you don't see the full growth of the vines uh, for a couple of seasons. Uh, so sometimes the pruning that happens in one winter, the more mature vine, the more severe the pruning. So the older the vine, 80 to 90 percent of pruning, 80 to 90 percent of the vine is pruned. That's tremendous cutback for growth that will happen two years later. So when you start thinking about some of the deficit, the deprivation, the challenges you're experiencing now, when you have a faith in God and you have history with God, you can have the faith to say, but I am looking forward to the day where God is bringing fruit from this time. And you can speak hope for a time to come in someone else's life. That's really what our Thanksgiving drive is about, is putting a deposit of hope for the future. To find your voice, ask yourself the right questions. And secondly, connect your story with his story. What is happening in your life? And how is God being reflected or expressed through it? Connect those together and you have something to say. So Jesus' original call was to find sons of peace. And my invitation to you today is threefold. Have something to say. And there's three elements to having something to say. And um, I'm going to uh, unpack this a little bit with you. But the three elements are fire, flow, and witness. Fire, flow, and witness. Use your passion to weave in the story of Jesus Christ. Many of you know Chris is a beekeeper. So he goes and he talks about bees. He does classes. And it's his passion. He's doing this to feed the life of the bees and feed the life of this planet. But right alongside the bees is his passion for the creator of the bees. And so he uses every opportunity to speak of the passion and the source. Does that make sense? In my 20s and 30s, I soaked myself in one scripture verse, John 10, 10. Jesus came that uh, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came that you may have life and life more abundantly. 
And my message, wherever I went, was to talk about extraordinary life. I actually wrote a book about it which never got published, because I'm so busy rewriting it. But wherever I went, uh, college campuses, um, businesses, book clubs, uh, wherever I went, I spoke about extraordinary life. What does extraordinary life look like for you? What is blocking your extraordinary life, your experience, your encounter? And let me tell you, the major thing that will unblock you and loose you into living an extraordinary life is the God of life in itself. And it doesn't matter what context you go into, you can use that message. Because I have had this passion my entire life is that God did not give you a life to survive. He gave you a life to thrive, to flourish, to take your talents, your gifts, and make something beautiful. That's part of my passion. Use your passion to weave in the story of Jesus Christ. So there's a verse from Jeremiah 20, verse 9, where Jeremiah says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. And Jeremiah speaks of this fire in his bones called God. And when you go and read the context of his words here, you realize that Jeremiah was so angry with God that he stopped speaking until he could no longer keep quiet. So he spoke from a place of reality. This anger, he spoke from that reality. There are points of passion in our lives. We need to learn to connect with God and connect with people in it. Sometimes we feel like we can't be authentic if we've got questions ourselves, if we've got doubt ourselves. If we've got anger ourselves. And when you're able to express your doubt, your anger, your questions, and still hold on to God, you get a powerful message like Jeremiah is giving you through the ages. This week I went with Stacy to go and visit Little Madison. It was a tough visit. Little Madison has had an experimental treatment. So at this point, the tumor has not grown any further. They don't know, and no one can tell them, if, the, if it was the impact of the experimental treatment or it's a progression of the, the brain stem cancer. But she's completely paralyzed. There's not a part of her body that she can move except her eyes and she can breathe. She's got a tracheotomy, but they only put her on oxygen in cases of emergency. It's very hard to connect the love of God in a situation like that, where a six-year-old is suffering like that. So we did a little huddle in the kitchen and the mom said to me, I don't even know where I believe. I am so angry with God, if you say. And I said, you, and I said, that is the absolutely appropriate emotion to have in this situation. I said, all we can do is pray. But you be honest about your anger. At the end of the visit, she invited me to come back, and I will. And my invitation to her will be, start speaking out your anger to God. Because you will be. These are bite-sized conversations, and we don't have all the answers. In a situation like that, I think God puts us to stand in the gap, to have faith, because they're in the war zone, where they're being bombarded second by second by second. 
So the people in our lives that we come across, we don't know what they're going through. We don't know the storms and the trials. So we need to break open our humanity and in the middle of that, the love of Jesus with them. The second element of having something to say is flow. On my way to meet with little Madison, Stacy and I had a 45 minute car drive. So I drove from Mattatuck to Medford, it's 45 minutes and then another 45 minutes. Now, we got in the car and we had a couple of hours to ourselves. There wasn't a moment's awkward silence. In other words, when you get together with someone that you're comfortable with, you just start talking. You're, it's, as Chris and I were saying, sometimes it's just a stream of consciousness, right? There's, there's not even a filter. Now this is what I'm talking about in terms of having a flow when you have something to say about who God is in the work of, of God. Is to think about a flow of communication that is easy. Not what you would sound like if you were doing a public presentation, or if you were standing behind the pulpit, but rather about giving voice to your life and God's connection in your life. A flow of communication that is easy. If we're going to share Jesus with others, we want to be at ease. We want an unrestricted flow of communication. So the question to look at is what blocks your flow? In public communication. One of the things that blocks flow, um, blocks freedom of expression, is self-consciousness. When you're thinking of proposing uh, to your life partner, you become incredibly self-conscious about all the things that could be misconstrued or not. There are moments in life that bring us to great uh, sense of self-consciousness. And in order to come into a real flow, you have to lay aside the self-consciousness. What do I look like? Or does it really matter? What do I sound like? Or does that really matter in terms of this just being my temporary home and the message that I have of God's great love for you? What blocks your flow is self-consciousness. The second thing that blocks our flow in terms of really sharing the magnificence of who God is is when we're experiencing a disconnect with God. Well, how can I talk about him when I don't even uh, feel like God is present, like God cares? So this disconnect with God is something that you have to actually name and own when you go through those times. And part of the call of God on our lives is to be able to get out there and share the good news, whether it is convenient or inconvenient, whether it feels like the right time or the wrong time, according to 2 Timothy 4. Preach the word, in season, out of season. Whether it's convenient or inconvenient, the Amplified says. So, the call is not based on your feeling, is it? The response to the call is not an emotional thing. I do believe God brings the emotions. When you say yes, God shows up. But this disconnect with God is something that must be addressed if you're going to be true to your call and your purpose. There's a bigger reason that you want to address the disconnect with God, right? And that is life does, is not coherent without connection with God. Life is not coherent, sane, majestic, without life-giving encounter with God. And I want to encourage you as we go into the Christmas season, make time. Forget about the shopping. Make time to sit at the feet of Jesus. Our worship sets are up on YouTube at, on Crossover's channel. You can take 15 minutes just to sit and listen to worship and get washed, get some of the calluses of the work week washed away. The other element that uh, blocks your flow is disconnect with the very person you're trying to reach. 
when you're out of sorts with the person you're trying to reach with the love of God, then you, you've got a problem. You have a problem. Right? So the challenge for us, don't you love this? The challenge for us is that if we're going to move in a flow of connecting with people and connecting them with God, we have to make right in some of our relationships. Let's get real, let's get honest here. Some of the people we're wanting to reach with the good news are people in our family. Broader family, intimate family. These are people who know us warts and all. These are people we have history and baggage with. So critical to finding sons of peace and sharing the good news is stepping into active forgiveness. When you bear with one another and you extend forgiveness. And you extend forgiveness just like Peter. You said, oh Lord, how many times should I forgive this guy? Seven times seven? We know the unfortunate answer, right? Seventy times seven? Forgiveness is a present continuous act. There are some aspects of forgiveness where you forgive, but you, you don't tolerate abusive behavior. You don't tolerate something that is going to crush you. But you walk in the freedom of forgiveness. And there's a clear distinction. So, to have something to say, you need a fire in your bones. And I think that's something we've got to pray about today. A fire in your bones, a flow of communication. And the third element is witness. If you're going to reach someone with good news, be authentic in how you speak. So that who you are and what your life is, is consistent with the message that you're giving. What is going to ring true with who you are? There are words that I use that you don't use. So, so for me, when I hear someone sharing a struggle, you will often hear from my mouth the words, Oh, shame. And it's an expression of empathy and compassion based in my South African history. So if you start saying, Oh, shame, I'm going to look at you and burst out laughing. I'll probably give you a hug, but it, it's, it's not you, it's me, right? I've told you this, how often in the first two years of living in the States, every time I went into a shop and they, they had a greeter to greet you, they'd say, how are you? I'd stop and tell them. <laughs> I know, isn't it sweet? <laughs> I think it got to the point where they saw me coming and they said, oh, heck no, I'm not even asking. Why ask the question? Exactly. Where's the authenticity? If you, if you want to know how you are, then if it's your job, then it's your job to listen to me as well. Beautiful quote here by Ronald Rollhauser. You cannot deal with the perfect, all-loving, all-forgiving, all-understanding God in heaven if you cannot deal with the less than perfect, less than forgiving, and less than understanding community here on earth. You cannot pretend to be dealing with an invisible God if you refuse to deal with a visible family. So there has to be fire, there has to be flow. And there has to be witness, authenticity. So what happens if you're trying to share a message with someone who really drives you up the wall? Well, it's one way to break open the relationship and just say, man, you're driving me up the wall. So I'm praying for you on a regular basis. And I just want to tell you that this is the message I think God has, is that we've got to work things through you. Yeah, you can practice it a little bit. I'm just giving you a spontaneous moment here. So here's the vision, guys. God is going to give us opportunities as we learn to say yes in obedience and faith. God is going to open doors of opportunity and conversation. And I want to encourage you to step through those doors with great faith and vision. Because there are going to be some people in heaven one day because you said yes on earth. Right? 
The other thing I want to really encourage you in this is to step outside of your box. You know, I love diversity. But there's always a little bit of diversity that challenges your, uh, your culture, your roots. And at some point, God is going to give you the opportunity of enjoying diversity with people. When you learn to love people who are not like you, who don't think like you, who don't look like you. And right there, you're starting to step into the real heart of God. Because God is the creator of all, and he loves all. And it's a powerful message to be able to step into someone's world and say, I don't understand all of this, but I know that God does and he really loves you. So I want to finish with this thought. God has chosen you to bear much fruit. John 15 verse 16 says, I have chosen, you did not choose me, but I have chosen you, and I've appointed you to bear much fruit, fruit that will remain. So are you thinking of yourself as a fruit bearer in the kingdom? Come on. It's time to put some combat gear on and get out there. You have a voice. Find your sons of peace. Come back to the story where Jesus sent out the 70. And uh, the end of the story is this. Then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They went out as young followers of Jesus Christ. And they brought heaven down. What are we doing? In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. And I want to say this to you. Don't wait for some kind of external qualification. You are a child of God. You're qualified to go and get the message, to pray for people, to see the power of Jesus change the lives of people you love and of people you don't care about. All it takes is for you to say yes and step out in obedience. I'd love to ask you to stand with me and I'd like to pray with you and then we'll invite the kids in and have communion. So Lord Jesus, I pray that you would stir up in us a burden of fire, a passion for the life of God and the face of the earth. And Lord Jesus, it, it seems that we are so small in our own sight. But you have laid your spirit on us. And I pray, Lord, for an impartation of faith of vision. That you would bring an impetus into the lives of your people here at Crossover. That we would not be silent. Send us out, Lord, to find sons and daughters of peace. People who are receptive to the good news. And Lord, I pray that you would give a boldness yeah. to each one of us to give voice. I will say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Won't you take a moment, take a seat. We're going to invite the youth to come to come out. Nick, Nick are you getting out? Liz, can you do that, please? Invite the, the kids. Thank you.